let's let's do this. Um, thank you for joining us today. We are Ali, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of South Dakota. We are coming to you from Sioux Falls today, which is South Dakota's largest city. Um, we are a part of the University of South Dakota, and every year in February, we do these little programs, um, invite everybody we can. We do them on Facebook as well, and uh, they're called Ollie Shorts. They're 20-minute programs with 10 minutes for questions and answers, and we let you go by one. We're just trying to give you a taste of what Ollie is all about, and I hope you enjoy it. I know you're going to enjoy today's program. Um, uh, stay tuned after the program. I do have a couple announcements on notes for programming the rest of the week, but we're good. Carry on, please. Awesome. Well, um, nice to meet you guys, um, and welcome to my Ollie Shorts talk on the 1870s grasshopper invasion. I'm going to be straightforward. I totally have notes for this because I'm a person that will deviate so far away from the topic that we cannot even see the topic anymore. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure to stay on point here, and I did make us a, a little presentation, um, so I will bring that up. Um, and I just want to verify that you guys can see it on my screen, correct? We're good? Awesome. So I'm going to get that going for us. And I wanted to talk about um, this specific historical marker. Um, but, you know, I'll introduce myself first. I think that's a, a good place to start as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm local Lou, and I like to explore our local history through historical markers. You can find some of this fun history on my website, localloupodcast.com, as well as more information and pictures on like specific historical markers that I've been to or covered on a podcast. Um, and then you can also catch me on Throwback Thursdays, which is on Dakota News Now at 9 a.m. on Thursday. And for that, I explore a different historical marker every week. Um, and I did talk about the grasshopper, the grasshoppers on Dakota News Now. And I found out a little tidbit that's going to be at the end of this. Um, so I did include that. And um, you can also see if you missed the Dakota News Now Throwback Thursday, I have a tab on localloopodcast.com so you can watch the video there. Um, last but not least, you can also just listen to the podcast and you can get that pretty much anywhere that you can listen to podcasts. A lot of people listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever floats your boat there. Um, so historical markers, uh, historical markers and plaques are my favorite way to learn local history and it doesn't have to be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It just so happens that's where I am. So that's where the bulk of my exploring historical markers is. But anytime I go on vacation, that's generally how I like to learn about the area is going to their local parks and areas that have these plaques and historical markers. And that's kind of my jumping off point. So Minnehaha County specifically has uh, way over 250, I would say around 275 different historical markers. And I think that's a great place to start with our history. Um, the South Dakota State Historical Society, I don't know the number, but it's probably around a thousand in the state. They have a ton. Um, and that's also a great opportunity to journey through our past and get to know a little bit about us and also kind of spark some questions. Um, so today we're going to look at the historical marker for the 1870s grasshopper invasion. It's located at Spellerberg Park, and um, that is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Specifically, though, if you're going to visit the park to look for this historical marker, it's on the 22nd Street side of the park, so it's right by the playground. Um, and today I'm going to cover the text that's on the historical marker, and then we're going to talk about was it really a grasshopper? <laughs> and then um, the invasion itself, the devastation, killing the hoppers, and the end of the story so far. Um, then, uh, let's see here, sorry. So often when I read a historical marker, I end up walking away with a lot more questions um, about what happened or how it happened. And so reading the historical marker is really just what sparks my interest in the history. It gives me the topic. It gives me the starting point. Um, and then I dive into a little bit of the research 
behind it. Um, maybe pieces of the history that didn't make it onto the historical marker. Um, so we're going to spark our interest today by starting with reading the historical marker. Um, when Then we're going to talk about some of the newspapers and books that I found while looking into the history of the historical marker. And to be fair, there, I know there's a lot more out there than what I have to show you guys today. But again, this is kind of a fun jumping off point for a historical marker that I think is pretty surprising. It has a lot of interesting little details in it. So the 1870s grasshopper invasion beginning in 1873 and for four consecutive summers, great swarms of grasshoppers riding prevailing winds reached the Midwestern states and territories where they landed and destroyed farmers' field crops. Although huge clouds of grasshoppers passed over Sioux Falls the first year, damage was really minimal in that area. In both 1874 and 1876, however, an incalculable number of grasshoppers arrived, darkening the sky and making sounds similar to thousands of scissors cutting and snipping. After landing, the large insects piled in some places to depths of five inches. They devoured everything edible in their paths, including crops, door sashes, window sills, shovel handles, leather boots, and fence posts. The hoppers feasted on family vegetable gardens and stripped buildings of their paint. Without crops to sell, to provide for future living and farm expenses, and to pay for seed for next year's spring planting, thousands of rural families were destitute. Immigration into Dakota Territory slowed to a trickle. After the second summer of devastation, a number of penniless settlers sold their farms, including the first owner of the land, which is today Spellerberg Park. So we're going to meet our main character. Here's the guy. This is the grasshopper. Um, this grasshopper is maybe a locust. So full disclosure, I'm going to say that I'm going to stay in my lane here. I am not an entomologist, but my understanding is that this little critter on the screen would start out as a grasshopper. However, with the correct conditions, once too many of them were hatched and were together, they would evolve, evolve into locusts. Thus, it's kind of interchangeable that it was a grasshopper or a locust, but a lot of the newspapers and word of mouth, people were calling them grasshoppers, and the historical marker itself calls them a grasshopper, so I think today we're just going to call this a grasshopper. But this is what the Rocky Mountain locust looked like, and it was a a big old grasshopper is what it was. So this is this is the look of, of what was swarming in huge clouds um, over the city, uh, which is kind of um, a lot to take in when you just see one little guy um, to understand exactly what these swarms looked like big, um, like storms of insects over your town. So we're gonna go here and look at the map um, one of the most important parts about the grasshopper invasion that I think of is this is a historical marker in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. This invasion was everywhere. It was in Canada. It was in Texas. It was a huge chunk of North America was affected by affected and infected with these grasshoppers. This was a big deal. Um, and so I think that's another interesting level for me as somebody that didn't hadn't really heard of this uh, to think that it was so incredibly widespread. Um, so it, this affected a huge swath of North America. In the map, you're going to see how widespread the phenomena was. As mentioned on the historical marker, you can see that Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in our area, um, it's really in the thick of the invasion in 1874, which is, this is an 1874 map of how things were affected. So while we're hit hard with these swarms of grasshoppers, we aren't the only victims. Uh, but, so the key of this map is they have the orangish color is 
okay, this is an overrun by grasshopper area. And then the red color is like, wow, this is straight up invaded by grasshoppers, but not a lot of people live here, so it's fine. And then the green is you're absolutely ravaged. So Sioux Falls, we're kind of on the cusp between the red and the green, and that's because it's 1874. So we're talking about like Sioux Falls was resettled for a couple, maybe five years at this point. There's several hundred people living here. So that's why we're getting kind of knocked down into that invaded, but they don't necessarily care because there's not a ton of people here. So Sioux Falls was very sparsely settled in 1874, making the devastation that much more devastating when you think about it. Um, the, these settlers, they're trying to make it in Dakota territory, and all of a sudden they have crops destroyed that might be the difference with between them being able to stay here or not. So in the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, the grasshoppers do get a shout out um, in on the banks of Plum Creek. She says grasshoppers went into the house with them. Their clothes were full of grasshoppers. Some jumped onto the hot stove where Mary was starting supper. Ma covered the food till till they had chased and smashed every grasshopper. She swept them up and shoveled them into the stove. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, this really paints a picture of how every day these swarms of grasshoppers had become in the settlers' lives. Um, and I think that we can all appreciate how Ma just covers the food, sweeps up the dead grasshoppers, and just kind of moves along with her day. Um, it's a little different than how I would probably react, but but if it was something that was happening all the time, you can understand how eventually you would get to the point where it's just like, okay, yeah, let's just keep going with our day, girls. Come on. Um, so in the South Dakota uh, historical collections, I found um, where they explain kind of how the swarms of grasshoppers would destroy what was in their path. So the pests came in great clouds from far northwest and settled down upon fields and gardens, which they soon destroyed. They would eat almost anything vegetable, but cut off the head of the wheat by eating the tender part of the stem. So it's kind of easy to see here how devastating the grasshoppers would be even if they didn't eat every bit of your crop, they're destroying it. You can't do anything with it. Um, and so they're ruining whatever money you had invested there, whatever opportunities that was going to get for your family, the grasshoppers just ate or they took a bite out of and now you can't sell it. So they're ruining the farmer's chance of a successful year and possibly even their chance to make it on their homesteaded land. The newspapers at the time, they can be tricky. I've, I've learned that along the way. Um, this is definitely um, my researching skills. They're getting better, but I'm learning a lot too where there's a lot of things in the newspapers where they're represented as facts. It's a lot of opinion, a lot of ideas and thoughts. Um, and then there's with, with this specifically, with the grasshoppers specifically, um, we're talking about an area that is just being settled, which means we are still trying to sell Dakota territory. We still want people to risk it all and come out here so we can make a couple bucks on this land that we that we have. Um, we want our towns to be successful. We want the railroads to keep coming. We kind of have a stake in this game. So um, the, the newspapers are also tricky in that regard um, because they have, they want things to feel very fertile. They want the soil to be amazing. They want the successes to be big, the harvests to be plenty. So we can keep that in mind, but I did find a couple interesting uh, things in the newspapers. Um, the Yankton Press and Union and Dakotan, Dakotian, August 6th, 1874, they write that the drought and grasshoppers have both had some effect in reducing the sum total of products of Dakota. 
The article then goes on to explain, though, that as long as this doesn't keep happening, we're actually going to have, like, too much corn. Like, this is really, it's going to be fine, guys. So this is kind of, again, an example of they're telling us the news, but they're kind of withholding a little bit of the news. Um, in the exact same newspaper on the same day, they report that a swarm of grasshoppers that was so thick, it affected train travel because the carcasses um, greased up the tracks. These grasshoppers are messy little guys, and they are full of things that are gross. <laughs> and so you have these big piles of them everywhere on the tracks, and it actually affected how fast this train could move. So that's a very good visual visualization of the multi-layered kind of dominant is that are happening here with the invasion. The Lincoln County Advocate in July 26th of 1876 provides a summary of the invasions. During the summer of 1873 and 1874, swarms of grasshoppers destroyed nearly all the crops in the county. The greatest injury was done in the summer of 1874 when the destruction was general and the loss heavily felt. This was the first serious and general calamity that the settlers of the county had met with. And they go on to say that the winters of 1874 and 1875 were really long and severe too, which paints a pretty desperate picture for somebody that just lost their crops. Um, these pioneers had been affected by grasshopper devastation, sure, but the grasshoppers, in fact, are only one part of their problem. They're only, um, they have so much more against them as they're trying to settle these wild prairies in Dakota Territory. Um, it's also interesting to think that this newspaper article, again, it's written in 1876, and on the historical marker, they tell us that 74 and 76 were bad summers. So they were writing this in, in July of 76, like, oh, 74 was bad, not knowing that they still had a little bit of a little bit coming their way that year. Um, located on the Loman Trail at Good Earth or Blood Run State Park, um, it's a historical plaque and it's named New Arrivals. And I will preface this real quick with this kid's name is Even, E-V-E-N. Um, so it, it might sound odd, but I wanted to make sure to say that before I read this. Um, so the historical plaque on the trail named New Arrivals, and it reads, crowded, cold, and damp, would probably describe even Loman's birthplace. His parents, Peter and Merritt Loman, came to Lincoln County with three children in the spring of 1870. Even's birth occurred that first winter when the family shared a dugout dwelling with the neighboring Ole Risty family. Norwegian immigrant farmers dominated this area along the Big Sioux River, and the early years were challenging. The 1870s saw several grasshopper infestations, which destroyed their crops. Winters were long and cold. Less hardy families left, but the Lomans and their neighbors persevered, building sturdier homes, improving their farms, and establishing schools and churches. So this really paints a picture for us that a lot of people came to Dakota Territory, but gosh, if you were coming at this time and you stayed, you were made of some really hardy stock because there was a lot going on that was preventing you from being super successful here. So killing the grasshoppers, obviously that is going to be a huge focus in the newspapers. Um, and as you can imagine, this advice is varied and it has a lot of theories and ideas and things that were possibly mildly successful and um, extremely dangerous. So soaking fabric in coal oil and dragging it across your field is one of the solutions that is offered here. Um, burning the grasshopper eggs, that is another option. However, that is very dangerous because there's a lot of risk involved as these burns could quickly get out of control because these invasions were often happening during droughts. 
so what are we what do we want to risk here <laughs> our our entire farm or just our crops <laughs> so um let's see here in the book locust the devastating rise and mysterious disappearance of the insect that shaped the american frontier by jeffrey a lockwood lockwood writes a, a little bit more about how they were trying to get rid of the grasshoppers. Pioneers and government agencies tried every imaginable method of control. They prayed for deliverance. They organized bounty systems, conscripted able-bodied men into grasshopper armies, and provided food aid for starving communities. Farmers tried to burn and beat the invaders, or failing this, they turned to drowning and plowing the eggs or crushing and poisoning the hatching locusts. Elaborate horse-drawn devices were invented to destroy the locust, and the most desperate farmers resorted to using dynamite to blast the egg beds of insects. This approach surely decimated the, <laughs> the pests but it also provided a hearty sense of revenge, uh, but pulverizing thousands of acres with explosives was hardly a viable strategy. And so a courageous and creative as these methods were, the locusts kept coming. A lot of people have not heard about the grasshopper invasion, meaning that we live in a world where this isn't a common occurrence anymore. So what happened to that Rocky Mountain locust? A puzzling phenomenon unfolded in the late 19th century. Rather than returning during subsequent drought cycles, the locust vanished completely over a few years. Back to Lockwood's book, he writes a little bit about this, that the swarms continued to pummel America's heartland into the 1880s, moving and settling with the caprice of tornadoes. These devastate the devastation was like that of living of a living wildfire. Um, finally, in the 1890s, the relief of a beguiled nation, the locust outbreak subsided. But this had happened before. So there had been other times where the locusts would stop and come back. So in 1902, Manitoba has an infestation of the grasshoppers. A lot of people wonder if they're coming back, but this actually happens to be the last time we see or hear from the Rocky Mountain locust. Um, they are more than likely extinct, uh, but it doesn't mean that grasshopper swarms aren't a modern day possibility. This is the little fact that I learned when I was on Dakota News Now. Um, the anchor Elle was telling me that she lived in Las Vegas and they had had a recent grasshopper swarm in 2019. Um, this swarm actually lasted like a week and a half and it made the news because it freaked people out, guys. <laughs> it was really surprising. Um, something that we have necessarily heard of in a really long time. Um, so we can't say that they won't be back. They just might not be the Rocky Mountain locusts that won't be back. <laughs> um, and so I will open it up to questions here. Um, I will say that a uh, little disclaimer that the nature of my history research with the Local Loop podcast, it's super varied and I jump around to a new topic pretty much every week. So I may not be an expert on this, but I will do my best to answer questions that you have on the 1870s grasshopper invasion. That was a great I just wanted, program. Go ahead, Anne. I, want, I just wanted to make a comment. My mom was uh, during the 1931 invasion in the middle of South Dakota, and she can recall them using an oil that had a banana scent to it to Ooh. try to kill off the grasshoppers. They would drive along in a cart and kind of pour it out behind them, this banana oil. And also, they even ate the starch off of clothes. And, and not just the whitewash off of fences. And I didn't even know these were organic things. So that was my comment. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, I've heard them eating quite quite a quite a lot of odd, odd things, including pieces of clothing. Yeah. I do have a question on Facebook. Um, is the Lincoln County Advocate available online? 
It is. Um, I have a subscription through like Ancestry for newspapers.com, but I think you can also find it on the Library of Congress um, as well, the Chronicling of America, I believe, newspapers. Excellent. Newspapers.com is a great source. It is so much fun. It's addicting. <laughs> yeah. You can really go down rabbit holes there. <laughs> I live in rabbit holes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Let's make sure that we put your um, podcast. Um, it's Local Lou Podcast. You got it. Okay. Dot com. Yes. Okay. Excellent. We're going to put that in the chat so people can grab that. And um, any other questions? Not seeing any online. Um, so is is local your first name? <laughs> no, it's not. Yep, my name's Lori. Nice to meet you, guys. Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered how you came about that uh, that name there. Yeah. So um, this kind of dates me a little bit, but if you guys remember that old um, Dr. Seuss, the Grinch that stole Christmas, the animated one. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was a little kid, uh, people called me little Lori Lou Who. So the, the Lou stuck around. <laughs> Do we think that the two cycles of locusts this summer will actually eat everything up? Do we, do we have any knowledge about that? Anybody? I mean, I think I think where we're at is if this were to happen today, we're in the same situation. Um, I don't think that there are any um, really great like mitigation efforts that are going to like solve this. When they swarmed Las Vegas, the you you waited it out. It you know for a week and a half. That was just what was happening in your town, and I feel like that is probably still accurate. Um, it would devastate crops. Um, I don't know if they would be able to come up with some kind of spray or something to deter them. I, I'm not aware of that. I read online that uh, the the locust the locusts that are coming, um, that are uh, more easter east of us, okay. like in Chicago, and that um, they uh, said try not to poison them because they are food for uh, animals that are on the ground, rabbits and birds and um, little animals that are on the ground that eat them and they go, they're not, they're, they devastate places, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not poisonous. <laughs> yeah. And they don't necessarily like, I mean, they kind of set up camp, but they're not there forever. You know, there's cycles. Right. Joan, did you have a question? Uh, it's not a question. I just wanted to say thank you. I, it's oh. really, really so interesting. And I'm interested in genealogy. So, and I had my, um, my Norwegian side of my family was like in the, in Yankton area. And oh, then great. the, the Waylands were in the Madison area. And, and when the Norwegians came in 18, really early, so they would have been living through this. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the other ones came in 1884. And I noticed that they, I think they picked up probably the homestead, um, the land of somebody who had homesteaded that area. And so now, you know, it sort of makes sense to think mm -hmm. that if they live through this, these other people, that they would want to get rid of it. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really, but thank you for that. It's nice background. So thanks. Oh, great. You're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, we're going to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fantastic. I do have, um, I do need to interrupt with a couple notes for later this week. Um, tomorrow, our Ollie Short is some advice from Chucky e. D, who turns out to be Charles Darwin. So if you're interested in Charles Darwin, it'll be a great class. Holly Straub from Vermilion will be doing that one. On Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday, we have had to switch around our programming. So Joan, this will be of note to you. The Scandinavian genealogical research tips are now on Wednesday instead oh. of Thursday. Oh my so, gosh. 
we okay. had to turn them around. Somebody had a funeral and uh, we, we tried to make it as possible for them to be all there as they could. So, so um, what time, can I ask what time is that then? It's same time, 1230 Central. On Wednesdays. On Wednesday, on this Wednesday. This Wednesday. Okay. Yep, thank it's you. a, it's a Ollie short. And then um, on Thursday will be uh, Eleanor Turner, who is a wonderful Ted talk speaker. You can find her on Ted talks and this is going to be a great session. It's called how not to name a baby. And I said, you know, most of us are past the baby thing. And she said, oh, trust me, they will want to hear this. <laughs> so it could help in naming pets, grandchildren, things like that. So that will be our, our final Ollie Short for 2024. And uh, I'm so glad that that uh, Lori could and could start out our week. And we're going to end it with a high as well. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Same link same time. We'll see you over the next three days. Lori, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, guys. Thank All you. All right. Take care.